Namo Amiga. Namo Amiga. Namo
Tata in Lumbini Garden, number 412. Okay, great. Right. H. A. So, Good morning. Thank you all for coming here today. Today we celebrate Shakyamuni's Buddha's birthday. In the legend, it is said that King Sadahana and Queen Maya were the rulers of a city named Kapalavatsu. Queen Maya had a dream that a white elephant with six tusks had entered her body. She asked, when she awoke, she asked the wise men what the dream meant. The wise men looked at each other and smiled, for they knew a blessed and wonderful child was to be born. As the birth of the baby neared, Queen Maya prepared to go to the home of her mother to have the child in accordance with the custom of the time. On her way, she stopped to rest at Lumbini Garden. As she lifted her right hand to pick the flower, a flower off the Asoku tree, the Buddha-to-be was born. The earth was said to shake in six directions, north, south, east, west, up and down. Everywhere flowers bloomed. A light sweet rain came down and bathed his, the baby Buddha's body. Immediately, the baby took seven steps, raised his right hand to the heavens and his left hand to the earth. And with the voice of a lion spoke, in the heavens above and on the earth below, I alone am the honored one. Today, our church tries to recreate this moment. We have the Hanamido that is decorated with flowers. This is to represent the Lumbini garden that Queen Maya took her, had rested. We pour, um, we pour sweet tea over the statue of Shakyamuni Buddha to represent the rain that bathed his body. The statue of Shakyamuni Buddha shows him pointing to the heavens and to the earth. We have learned great wisdom from the Buddha. We are still learning more. Thank you. It is said that on the memorable day of April 8, 566 BC, the Queen Maya was on her way to her parents' house. The Queen, with all her servants, stopped to rest at the King's garden. Suddenly, as the Queen plucked a flower from a tree, a little baby boy was born. The little baby boy, born to Sadar King Sadahadana and Queen Maya, was named Siddhartha, which meant every wish fulfilled. His full name was Siddhartha Gautama, for Gautama was a family name. Very soon after he was born, writers tell of the baby Buddha taking seven steps. Most people, when they hear this, immediately reply that a baby cannot take seven steps when he is born. How easy it is to say that something is wrong when one does not know the true facts of the matter. Long ago in India, spiritual teachers spoke often of the six great wrongs that drive man to the depths of the world in suffering and trouble. These spiritual leaders told man that they must erase these six wrongs of ignorance, greed, pride, etc., from their lives before they would ever be able to take the seventh step, the final step, into Buddhahood. The writers of long ago were telling us that in this baby Buddha's life, he would overcome all six wrongs and then would take the seventh step into Buddhahood. People of different times write in different ways. We should not jump to any conclusions about anything until we understand the true facts of the matter. That is why we should follow the noble eightfold path given to us by Shakyamuni Buddha. This method of right thinking and acting lead to eternal happiness. We must see the right views, think the right thoughts, speak the right speech, act the right conduct, live, live the right livelihood, put forth the right effort, remember the teachings at all times for the right mindfulness, and just to sit and remember that Amida Buddha is always with us for the right meditation in order to ever be able to be re in reach of the seventh step of obtaining Buddhahood. Step by step and thought by thought, we as a whole should try to understand the Buddha and his teachings. And to remember the, that Amida Buddha is the unchanging Buddha who is always with us. Today we celebrate Gautama Buddha's birthday on Hanumatsuri. We must understand Siddhartha Gautama and the alignment in which he is found to lie within oneself and needs not to be looked for, but just to be used and bloomed to its full extent. Thank you. Good morning. It's been written that when Siddhartha Gautama was born, he took seven steps, raised his right hand to the heavens and his left hand to the earth, 
and stated, In the heavens above and on the earth below, I alone am the honored one. By saying this, the ancient writers stated that Siddhartha would overcome the six great wrongs and take the seventh step into Buddhahood. Siddhartha soon came to be known as Shakyamuni Buddha. We celebrate Shakyamuni Buddha's birth each year on the Sunday closest to April 8th. The way we celebrate this festival, known as Hanumatsuri, is to remind us of the wonderful teachings of the Buddha. The sweet tea poured over the image of the Buddha reminds us of the gentle rains that fell to bathe him. The flower-covered altar is symbolic to the Lumbini Garden. The lotus flower, commonly used on the altar, represents the enlightenment of the Buddha, and the dying of the lotus represents the impermanence of all living beings. Like other, childlike, like other wonderful childlike stories, the one of the birth of Shakyamuni Buddha is a fascinating world of images. It is an outline of enlightenment and let us stop and see where we were and who we are. Thank you. We are, all here, we, are, we are all here today to celebrate the birth of an extraordinary person. This person which I speak of is Siddhartha Gautama, who later enlightened to become Shakyamuni Buddha. This special day is known as Hanumatsuri, which means literally flower festival, or also known as Buddha Day, and is also comm comm commemorated on the 8th of April. During the Hanumatsuri services, the various rites are based upon the happenings at the time of Prince Siddhartha's birth. The Hanamido, or miniature flower altar, of beautiful flowers represents Nubini's garden. The statue of the baby Buddha illustrates his arm extended, his right arm extended, reaching out to all beings. This pouring, or the pouring of the sweet tea represents the gentle rain which fell that day in Nubini's garden. Immediately after he was born, the baby rose upon his feet and walked seven steps, raised his right hand toward the sky and left hand downward, and proclaimed, Above heaven and below heaven, I alone am the world honored one. Buddha showed us by taking the seventh step and began or beyond the six realms of suffering or human bondage. And indeed took the seventh step to enlightenment. We as human beings are treading the paths of six realms of, suff of sufferings, but only the Buddhas tr transcended the six realms and took the seven steps to enlightenment. We all can take the seven step because all beings possess Buddha's nature or the seed for enlightenment. The most important thing that Buddha taught us was that all, that by realizing our highest pot potentiality, that we could attain Buddhahood. Thank you. Kyudo Kai speech, Akira. Good morning. You heard all my kids moaning because of the length of my speech that, that I'm making. <laughs> they want a short speech and so I'll try to make it as short as possible. It's really not that long. It's double spaced and I had to make it a larger type because uh, I can't read it without my bifocals. So <laughs> that's why it seems like it's long. It's a lot of pages but it's not a long speech. This is a very special day, not only for us, but for a lot of other religions also. Because on this day, the, those of the Jewish faith uh, are celebrating Passover, and those with, uh, uh, that are Christians are celebrating Easter. Uh, Shakyamuni Buddha was born in 563 BC, so we're celebrating Buddha's 
2,554th birthday. The celebration has not always been called Hanamatsuri. It start, was started uh, called Hanamatsuri since 1901 when 18 scholars in Germany got together and named it Hanamatsuri or the Flower Festival. It's appropriate that we call it Hanamatsuri or the Flower Festival for many reasons. First, it is symbolic of the Lumbini Garden, as the kids have said, of Siddhartha's or Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, birth. Another flower that represent that I just found out today is a wisteria flower or the mom of the Hongganji, which is the symbol of the Hongganji now. Uh, it is also a flower and represents the Hongganji uh, sect of Buddhism. Next, the lotus flower, and uh, the lotus flower is seen a lot in Buddhist literature um, that the lotus flower is a, has symbolic significance in Buddhism because the lotus flower grows in warm and swampy uh, regions of the of the world, but it also is a flower that grows in, in swampy and murky waters, and that it symbolizes that the Buddha was able to attain enlightenment in, in light of the fact that he lived among people filled with blind desire and passion, and yet rose above them to bloom in full enlightenment. Therefore, the lotus is used alone to symbolize enlightenment which was attained by the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. Next, the flower is often used not only during Hanamatsuri, but during every service. The flower uh, beautifies the altar with its color, with the scents uh, and smell that it provides. But it also wilts and dies within a week or so so that the flower teaches us impermanence, that all things are impermanent and that change is a constant and to accept change will avoid much suffering and sorrow. Artificial flowers do not die, but that they can also teach us an important idea. Artificial flowers should not be used on the altar but they can teach us how easily we can deceive ourselves by artificial and untrue. We often deceive ourselves into thinking highly of ourselves. We wrap ourselves with a plastic facade just like the artificial flower and we believe that we are honest, we are good, altruistic, smart, etc. This then leads to a belief that we are better than other people for every artificial reason for very artificial reasons. We then begin putting importance into things that are insignificant. I want to read an article also that kind of uh, emphasizes this point. Asking the computer how to live. A scientist once programmed the computer to answer the following question. In an uneasy age where we are constantly flooded with information and dependent on mechanical devices to survive, what is the best way to live? The computer's answer was short and to the point. Select only those things that are truly important. Isn't this a suitable answer? Whether it is television program, a book, a job, the form of entertainment, Regardless of what it is, select only the best or the most important. We often stop to consider it. We always seem to be pushing off to one side the most important question of our life that must be answered. We evade this important question by raising status of questions and problems of lesser importance and allowing them to occupy our thoughts. When we are young, it's getting a date, or our schooling, whether we can make the team. When we grow older, it's our job we hold, or getting married to the right person. When it becomes, then it becomes worrying about our children. 
When we get older still, we worry about our health, our retirement. There is no time when, when we are not worrying about something. But isn't there something that must be solved or decided before anything else? Suppose there are five problems in a math test which we must solve in an hour. What sequence are you taught to take the test? Do you start with the easiest problem? Once you, you have solved that and know that you will get some kind of grade, you will be able to concentrate on the next most important, most difficult problem more easily. Leave the most difficult problem until the very last. And, that, and if there is time remaining by tackling it, you will get 100% right. This probably is the way that you are taught how to take a test. However, the test of life that you receive in the classroom of life must be solved in exactly the opposite order. If you leave the most difficult question until the very last, there is no assurance that you will have time to solve it. This is how life is. No one can foretell when the bell ending the examination of life will ring. Do not dally in solving the greatest problem. Long before computers were even thought of, the admonition presented above was repeated over and over in Buddha Dharma. What is the greatest problem? problem? Answer these questions for yourself. What is the reason that this person as I was born? The second question, upon what should I base my life? The third question, what happens when my physical body disappears? There are some who quickly answer the first question by saying, my purpose in living is to work. They, are they any different from ants who are conscientiously perform their daily work for the benefit of the hive? There are others who say they work only to raise their children properly. but it, but. It is wrong to live our lives through our children. They have their own life, lives to live. The first thing you must do is to be able to answer these three questions given above. When you can, you, you have laid the foundation for a life which will continually unfold and grow into something beautiful. How many days have, you, have there been that you could say, today I live fully and have no regrets about it? Count yourselves lucky if you have even one. Isn't your usual feeling, one of these days when I get this cleared away, then, it, then I will be able to live a fuller life. This means that you are not living life to, to its fullest now. The work before you will always be with you all your life, waiting until it is done before living life to its fullest will not work, for that day will never come. Let us awaken our sleeping heart. Buddha Dharma and the Nembutsu within it, within it shows us how to live life to its fullest and freest. Start today, let us listen to the Dharma, the teaching which shows us our true nature and awaken in us our, the infinite compassion of the Amida Buddha. something in my bag this morning. Let me show you what I have. It's a picture of my mom and my dad. My mom. My mom's name is Toshko. My dad, he died seven years ago. His name was Masao. I remember playing a game with my daughter, Lisa, she's 11. It was called Disney Trivia. And my daughter beats me every time. I remember a few questions. One question was, what is Pinocchio's father's name? It's Geppetto. 
Another question was, what is Dumbo's mother's name? What is Dumbo's mother's name? If you say Mrs. Jumbo, you're right. <laughs> Mrs. Jumbo, yeah. See, I got these answers from my daughter. I didn't know them. Today we are celebrating the birth of Siddhartha Gautama, who became Shakyamuni Buddha. All of you know the answer now because the, the young people told you. What was the Buddha's father's name? King Suddhodana. And his mother's name was Queen Maya. The life of the Buddha has been told and retold many, many times. And the birth of any great religious leader is exaggerated. But for Buddhism, the birth story has many symbolic meanings, such as the seven steps, the, the sweet rain that fell, many, many symbolisms that we use within the Hanamido. If you look in the mirror, if you look in the mirror, we see that we have two eyes. Two eyes to see the compassionate beauty, to see the truth. We have two ears. Two ears to listen to the Buddha Dharma. We have one mouth. We have one mouth so that we don't talk too much. <laughs> or we don't eat too much. Or we have one mouth. It'd be great to have two mouths. Then you can talk and eat at the same time. Of all the people, of all the people in, the, in this earth, they have come to be born by many differing conditions, many differing causes. And there are many billions of mothers in this world, and each one different. However, for me, there is only one mother who brought me into this world. The more I realize how precious my life is, the more I realize how irreplaceable and wonderful my mother is. Queen Maya died seven days after the birth of her son, Siddhartha. And so I'm sure that Siddhartha, growing up, really missed, really missed his mother. He was raised by his aunt. And I'm sure the aunt gave him love and kindness. But it's not the same as receiving the love and kindness from your own mother. To recognize that my mother is the best is to recognize that for each one of us, your own mother is the best. So this feeling that my mother is the best is shared by each one of us. And because we share this same feeling, when it comes to Buddhism, we can also share this same feeling that for me, the Nembutsu, the Namu Amida Butsu, is the path, the best path for me. In understanding that the teachings of the Buddha, I think 
for me growing up, it was beneficial. It was beneficial because as I studied the teachings of the Buddha and as I was going to school, there was no conflict in learning one or the other. In fact, the study of Buddhism helped me to understand what I learned in the public schools. Many religions cannot say this. For I had a conversation with a school teacher, and this teacher had told me that a minister came to him, a Christian minister, and said, you teach biology in your school. And I understand you teach evolution. How come you don't teach creation in your class? And the teacher said to this minister, do you teach evolution at your church? And the minister said, no. He says, so why should I teach creation in the public school? So to understand what is going on in the public school, Buddhism does not conflict with that. Friday I was reading the paper and I took out an article. But before I get into this article, I would like to say that I enjoy Hanamatsuri. I enjoy Hanamatsuri because spring is here. And I see life budding and blossoming. I hear birds singing. And the golf courses are getting green. <laughs> I mentioned this before that the Buddhist approach to life is horizontal. And I, I view a Christian approach as being very vertical. Now one approach isn't better than another, they're just different approaches. I explained that in Buddhism, the architecture, a traditional Buddhist temple, if this is the roof, you enter here. And so you get the horizontal feelings from the roof lines as you enter. The Christian church, if you enter here, usually here, and there's a steeple going up or a cross. So architecturally, in Christian architecture, you get a very vertical feeling. In terms of concepts, in Christianity, heaven is symbolically up, hell down. The Buddhist nirvana, or jodo, pure land, symbolically in the West. Religious leaders, Jesus died vertically. He died on the cross. The historical Buddha, died lying down on his right side. And as Buddhists, we express this. So young Christian children, young Buddhist children are influenced by the environment, their religious environment. And as Buddhists, we express this horizontal feeling every day. Before we eat, we say, Itadakimasu, Namo Amitabha. Itadakimasu means I put on top of my head. Which means that I am no better than the food I am eating. It is because of circumstances I am allowed to partake of this food, to nourish my body, to continue my life. So itadaku, to put on top of my head, symbolizes this horizontal relationship with all living things. As I mentioned, 
had an article I'd like to share with you out of the Friday paper. And the says here, judge quotes Bible. A judge quotes Bible. Goes easy on pup dumping. This is St. Peter, Minnesota. A judge has cited biblical references in fining a man only one dollar for leaving five puppies to die in a trash can, saying, quote, God ordained the killing of animals. This article keeps on going. It says, it comes to about 20 cents a puppy. It's hard for me to understand the justice there, said Rita Bauman, president of the Blue Earth County Humane Society. The puppies were rescued and survived. But this judge said he found nothing criminal in this man's action and noted numerous references in the Bible about killing of animals. God ordained the killing of animals. He himself killed animals to provide skins for Adam and Eve. So as I read this, I was really shocked. And this judge continues, many people today are working hard to expand the rights of animals. Yet the same people are not concerned about millions of unborn babies that are slaughtered each year, many of whom, like these puppies, are tossed into dumpsters after being killed. As I read this article, I thought, perhaps the method of teaching is wrong. Because the Bible condones the killing of animals, would that not influence people to uh, destroy puppies? And the step further, would that not condone people dealing with abortion? Whereas for us as Buddhists, we have the golden chain. The golden chain states, and I quote, I will be kind and gentle to every living thing and protect all who are weaker than myself. End of quote. So the golden chain, it tells us about this horizontal relationship with all forms of life. And the golden chain is true not because a superior being commanded it, but because, because we are increasingly aware of the unity of all life. And that to harm others is to harm the unity of which we are a part. Buddhist oneness, Buddhist harmony. This depends upon the experience of ourselves as intimately and directly connected to everything else. And where harming another is seen as part of a single organism making war on itself. As Buddhists, we accept differences. For we see that differences, that's the nature of life. And that to insist that others think and feel, as we do, is the seed, the seed for conflict and disharmony. From a religious point of view, the only access, the only access I have to this single organism or this oneness 
is me, myself. This is the only access I have to this oneness. So looking inward is thus the only way of looking outward. And this looking inward requires a kind of honest self-reflection that we are not used to, something we're not really used to, an honest self-reflection. One that most often makes us fearful or defensive as we approach who we really are. Passing through that defensive wall of ego is the business of Buddhism. And in order to pass through the wall, one must first see the wall. Beyond that wall of ego-centeredness is oneness. It does little good to believe in oneness. One must pass through the wall and participate in it. And you know, beyond that wall is yet another wall. Endless frustration, endless fascination, endless joy. And so for this reason, I feel fortunate that I encountered or I was allowed to experience the Buddha Dharma. So, for those of you who, whose parents are Buddhist, you're very fortunate. For those of you who, whose parents were not Buddhist, you are also fortunate to have heard the teaching that opens up, that liberates, the human individual. <coughs> in closing, please join me in Gasho. Namo Amidops. Namo Amidops. Namo Amidops. Namanda. I'd like to have the four Sunday school children step forward, please. Kanji, Hideo, Seiji, and Richard. For <laughs> job well done. We have a little moment for you. Seiji, Richard. Also, at this time, I'd like to present this to Reverend. You're supposed to open this, Alice. Oh, I'm supposed to open this? Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> open the instruction inside. <laughs> tick, 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 tick. tick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh yeah, I'm the year of the sheep. Yes, thank you.
Uh, it's number 125. At this time, Richard and Sage will pass out the flowers. We'll sing the first two verses. born into human form. Now we are living it. Difficult is it to hear the teachings of the blessed ones. Now we hear it. If we do not deliver ourselves in the present life, no hope is there that we shall be freed from suffering and sorrow in the ocean of birth and death. Let us reverently take refuge in the three treasures of the truth. I take refuge in the Buddha. May we all together absorb into ourselves the principle of the way to enlightenment and become aware of his supreme teaching. I take refuge in the Dharma. May we all together be submerged in the depth of his doctrine and gain wisdom as deep as the ocean. I take refuge in the Sangha. May we all together become units in true accord, in the life of harmony, in a spirit of universal brotherhood, free from the bondage of selfishness. Even through ages of myriads of kalpas, hard is it to hear such an excellent, profound, and wonderful doctrine. Now we are able to hear and receive it. Let us thoroughly understand the true meaning of Tathagata's teaching. Namo Amidhaps. Namo Amidhaps. Namo Amidhaps. Namo Amidhaps. Has announcements here. Akira, <laughs> but Akira said he didn't want to come up here anymore. So uh, this concludes our first uh, service. I mean, our first portion of our Hanumanji program. We have a delicious potluck luncheon being served in the back. Uh, we'd like for all of you to stay. Uh, Bill and Cameron, if you could stay with us and have lunch with us, we'd appreciate it very much. Also at this time, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the program, but as you noticed, our new Han our Hanamido has been renovated. I think. And it was due to the work of Mrs. Kanabe and Ms. Ashida. For a job well done, we thank you. Many changes in the last 75 years. What does the future hold? More changes. There is an old Japanese saying, life is a chain of uncertainties and all things are subject to change.
this video, which commemorates the 75th anniversary of the Tri-State Buddhist Temples, is dedicated to the memory of the Issei men and women who practiced Jodo Shinshu with steadfast Shinjin and perseverance. It is through their efforts that our temples have become a reality, and the Buddhist way of life has been passed on to future generations.